With this brief introduction and opening of the meeting, I'll transition to the first very short presentation, which is aimed to be half primer, half highlight of current trends. And this is this type of presentation is very much motivated by the aspiration that they shared that we want everybody to be able to understand the discussions as much as possible. And that's why I'm going to introduce some of the basics of mass spectrometry and what are some of the um, important objectives that colleagues are pursuing. This will not be all inclusive. There will be many important objectives that are not covered in a short presentation, but they hope to make it a little bit more accessible for those of you who come from different fields. And similar to this primer introduction, uh, next, tomorrow we are going to have a primer introduction to single molecule proteomics by Jeff Nibala. Okay, so most protein analysis of single cell by mass spectrometry is done by what is known by as bottom-up mass spectrometry. That requires preparing the samples, which has been a major challenge and a big focus of technology development in the field for years. How do we prepare samples from tiny cells while minimizing contamination, maximizing efficiency of delivery? And then proteins are digested to peptides, peptides are separated, and the, and the quality of separation is incredibly important. You're going to hear a few talks during this conference from both um, academic leaders in this area, and we have some uh, presenters, uh, uh, sponsors who are developing excellent solutions for that. Then molecules have to be ionized into ions so that we can analyze them by mass spectrometry. And this tends to be the least efficient step of converting molecules from the single cells from the chromatographic column into ions inside of the mass spec instrument where they can be sensitively detected and analyzed. And then, of course, we acquire mass spectra and analyze the data. And just to give you a Big picture view of where we stand on these various stages. At the moment, we can prepare order thousands of single cells simultaneously in one go. Some of the approaches allow that. Of course, not all of them. Some approaches are uh, less parallelizable. We can now analyze over a thousand single cells in a single day uh, by mass spectrometry to quantify their proteomes. And the depth of coverage varies very significantly depending on the size of the cell. We certainly quantify fewer proteins from a tiny T, -T cell as compared to a HeLa cell as compared to an oocyte. And of course, it depends tremendously on the uh, technology use, the instruments, data acquisition approaches. Some of the new instruments have really facilitated increasing the, the depth of coverage. So I'll summarize with this introduction, I'll summarize some of the big trends in both methodology development and in applications and biology. With the methodology, one of the theme for the last few years that so continues unabated and even accelerates is figuring out ways to increase the throughput. We, because we want to analyze large number of single cells at low cost, at deep coverage. And the approaches to increase throughputs can be summarized very simply as either decreasing the amount of time that each sample is analyzed, and that usually involves shortening the separation time, or doing things in parallel, either analyzing many cells in parallel or fragmenting many peptides in parallel and analyzing their fragment. Conceptually, those are the approaches that we can use to drive throughput. And here is a big picture summary of different methods that exist, mass spectrometry methods, so do different levels of parallelization, parallelize either sample analysis or parallelize peptide fragmentation and data acquisition. Now, the throughput sounds kind of simple thing, but in reality, evaluating and benchmarking throughput is quite complex. It's a high dimensional metric because it is not only the number of cells per day, but it's also the depth of coverage, it is the accuracy, and there are many additional metrics that affect the throughput. It's 
the size of the cells. It is easier to achieve high throughput with higher cells because we can have shorter accumulation time, faster stages of the analysis. It is very important to think about efficiency of ion utilization because at the end of the day, the goal for many of our analysis is not detection, but it's quantification. And unless we are able to efficiently deliver many copies, of a particular analyte peptide protein, then we we have major problems with counting noise that are unsurmountable by any technological improvement. We just have to count enough copies. And of course, as we speak of throughput, it's also very important to keep that in context of are we identifying sequences based on robust fragmentation of many fragment ions, or are we using much between runs based only on MS1 information? So that becomes a little bit more technical, but I wanted to uh, highlight this complexity of benchmarking and evaluating throughput and that there can be more than one objective and can be challenging to evaluate. Nonetheless, I want to give you a low dimensional snapshot projection of some types of analysis that we do in my lab and what the throughput is. And such approximated metric of throughput is number of samples that we can analyze per day, number of, of cells, and number of proteins that we can quantify per cell. And here is the summary of two methods. Uh, they both use various levels of parallelization, either using prioritized scope with isobaric multiplexing that allows analyzing over 1,000 single cells, 1,018 uh, single cells per day demonstrated and quantify uh, about 1,000 proteins per cell. Or with Plex DIA, we can analyze order 100 uh, single cells per day, quantifying large number of proteins. And of course, this has to be put in context with various caveats. This can be further increased throughput by using um, approaches to minimize the overheads on sample loading and column washing, such as EvilSAP has enabled, and can easily increase the throughput further. But just to give you an impression of what this data looked like now of the approach analyzing over a thousand single cells per day, we can derive quantitative information that only a few years ago took us more than a month to generate this data. And now it takes just a few days to, to do everything going from cells to um, acquiring the data. And I would not call this high throughput. It is higher that, than what we had last year and higher than what we had a year before. But next year is going to be yet higher. And I don't want to be embarrassed by saying that this is high. This is not high. This is what we can do now. But next year, we are going to do better, I hope, with everybody's help and contribution. Another big theme in the community for a long time has been the analysis of post-translational modification. They're clearly very important for understanding multiple aspects of biology, in particular signaling mechanisms. And this has been a goal since the very beginning. Even in 2019, we were doing variable search for phosphorylation and methylation and acetylation. And we were using back then enriched isobaric carrier channels. And we and others have reported a number of examples where uh, various post-translational modifications can be identified and quantified. But what I think the big frontier is to be able to quantify the relevant post-translational modifications that would help us answer biological questions, to quantify them very consistently across large number of cells, not just detect, but quantify reliably. And this continues to be uh, an exciting area with lots of movements in, 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 in that direction. And I think we are going to hear more than one presentations throughout today and tomorrow of approaches that the different colleagues are following to push the boundary a bit further. And we also have, as a technological frontier, the development of spatial proteomic methods. They're either also proteoform imaging, and we have some representation of that. Last year, we had a talk from Neil Kelleher, and uh, this year, again, we'll return to some of the progress of detecting proteoforms from individual cells using uh, single ion methods. 
uh, and from there, there has been also movement in the direction of analyzing organelles from individual cells, such as nuclei, and that's certainly a direction that I'm excited about. And uh, Jason Dirks uh, is going to share with you uh, work from my lab that we have been able to quantify protein transport from the cytoplasm to the nucleus and characterize its regulation. And that is nicely transitioning into the biological applications, because at the end of the day, all this technological development that we have been doing for a long time is very much motivated by the ability to start identifying regulators, to start asking and answering uh, biological questions that have not been accessible until now. And I think the frontier in this direction is very wide. There is a lot to be done, and many people can contribute to that. I'll just highlight a few directions that to me appear particularly promising, and I'm sure we are going to, to, to hear more such directions throughout the meeting. One of those is, of course, to ask to what extent various phenotypes that we have measured, various specialized functions in tissues, are mediated and performed by regulating protein by regulating protein synthesis or degradation. And since we are able to measure nucleic acids quite well in single cells, the data types are set to start doing this analysis. We have tried doing this for quite some time. Here is uh, a figure from the early work of Harrison Speck when he was still a PhD student in my group that illustrates a challenge. We need to know what is the noise in these measurements to be able to tell if the, if the differences between RNA and protein in this context are purely driven by technical noise, or do they represent interesting interpretable biology? And evaluating reliability of the measurements is very important and not so easy to do. So we, we've spent a lot of time on thinking how to do this properly. Uh, and it has to do with performing measurements using multiple different methods that don't have the same shared biases. And you're going to hear about this during this meeting from, from Saad and Megan uh, about our work in this direction. But I hope that there will be many others as well to present uh, in movements in that direction. And I'll just um, say briefly that we did find a lot of protein regulation that is not detected uh, at the transcript level, but Megan and Saad are going to tell you the full story. Uh, and of course, as data become more quantitative, we can start moving from just describing cell clusters and more descriptive approaches that frankly have dominated single cell RNA sequencing, which is very much affected by counting noise. We can start moving towards more quantitative modeling of the data, which can help us constrain biological mechanisms. And these models can, can vary from being thoroughly abstract and identifying reliably simply difference between protein and RNA abundance and saying that there must be regulation to being much more detailed where we can measure with metabolic pulse directly rates of protein synthesis or degradation, and we can write models that allow us to uh, infer mechanisms. And to be able to drive these biological applications, I think that one of the major challenges for the community, especially the community that is more focused on the methodology and method development, is to make our methods accessible. Because there are thousands of people, and I've received thousands of emails from colleagues who would love to use the methodology, the technology, but it is not yet accessible. I know that many of us have tried hard to make it accessible. We certainly have. And we haven't fully succeeded. It's an ongoing process. And this conference is part of this process of explaining what it is that we do. And I think there are many um, 
uh, many parties that can contribute to this. Of course, developers can make methods simpler, easier to implement. I also think that companies have a major role to play by helping standardize certain procedures and providing more application support than what an academic lab is ever likely to perform. And as the field matures, we are going to move in that direction, which I think is very important to deliver on the promises. Uh, but as we are moving, we should try to accelerate the rate of that movement. They not, I, I, I really would like to try and do as much as we can. And as part of that, to, uh, on Thursday, we are going to have a workshop of demonstrating one workflow starting from single cells to generating uh, single cell protein measurements. Uh, unfortunately, the workshop was heavily oversubscribed. We could offer it to only a fraction of people who were interested and who are thinking of ways of having more of these workshops and extending it. It's an ongoing uh, opportunity for, for the field to really share the technology that we've developed. And one thing that we did in that direction, also sharing the technology, was to get together with many of the leaders in the field and write initial set of guidelines and recommendations for all of you who are interested to start performing single cell protein analysis by mass spectrometry. We hope that these guidelines and these lessons that we've learned the hard way can be useful and beneficial to shorten your path to generating robust interpretable data. So I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions or engage in more discussions. Thank you. Uh, I'm very interested in the uh, 32 plex uh, method. So can you talk about more about this technique? So it's actually a 35 plex. At the time when we did it, we did not yet have all the tags, but uh, Proteome Sciences and Thermo Fisher Scientific have increased the plex of TMT Pro. Uh, it works similar to the current uh, TMT Pro that is on the market, but has more labels. And they've incorporated to increase the, the plex. They've also incorporated deuterium, which make some causes some challenges with retention time shifts. We did not find this to, to severely affect quantification in our data. Uh, but let me see, we are not going, you might hear, you might learn a lot more about this method from Andrew Leduc's poster, he, uh, he can tell you more. But it's, it's similar to, to TMT Pro, just higher plex. And then we applied this within the framework of prioritized scope. Okay, thank you. Frank. Hey, Nikolai. Great talk. Uh, what's the medium or near to medium term outlook for Plexdia? We we have a couple of exciting things on the side of Plexdia coming up. One is at PTI, we have early results of developing molecules that improve charge stabilization which helps increase sensitivity and generate more MS2 fragments to give us higher probability of sequencing, less abundant uh, peptides. And of course, that's one aspect of increasing depth of coverage, improving quantification. And another very important one is to keep increasing the throughput by making more mass tags. So we hope to have at least nine to 20 plex later this year, but this is a projection. We're not yet ready to to demonstrate it. And, and in many ways, this going back to the question also related to the 32 plex, as we speak about throughput, there are these different trade-offs of how we can analyze a um, larger number of cells, but we are affected by co-isolation when using isobaric mass tags, while with the plex DIA, we are able to achieve higher depth of coverage without the co-isolation. So there are various trade-offs. The prioritization, on the other hand, allows us to focus more specifically on analytes of interest, which can be post-translationally modified peptides. And one application that we focused previously was analyzing proteolytic cleavage. Um, so there are many methods of, of multiplexing, and it's hard to compare them just on one dimension. Any other questions?
Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, really nice talk. Uh, just an introductory question. Uh, which kind of uh, answer the single cell proteomics can resolve? No, think about the biology. What is the difference in single cell proteomics regarding the single cell transcriptomics? Well, I think it's not one answer. There are many answers. I try to give some broad categories, uh, but uh, certainly I'll give you one that is very clear cut outlier that we published last year in Nature Methods, and that was the analysis of proteolysis upon macrophage stimulation. We stimulated primary macrophages with lipopolysaccharides, and we measured their transcriptome, proteome responses, and with the mass spectrometry, we were able to measure proteolytic cleavage products that reported on the activation of proteases. And none of that can be inferred even indirectly with any level of confidence from the RNA measurements. But this is just one out of lots of lots of questions that mass spectrometry or proteomics in general can answer that transcriptomics will not answer. And I think you're gonna hear many more examples throughout the meeting. Yes. Thanks very much for the great work you've been doing. Uh, where are we with regard, and maybe this will come up during the meeting, with regard to registering where individual single cells are and, and single cell proteomics, in other words. Ah, that's, that's an important context. What is the spatial context of single cells? So there have been a few different methods developed. The oldest method that has been used for about a decade or more in that regard is laser capture microdissection. Uh, and the direction of development of that method has been to make the section smaller and smaller and smaller and to increase the rate of acquisition. In the past, rate of sample acquisition has been challenging. The laboratory of Matthias Mann has made great progress with deep visual proteomics, reducing the samples in size and introducing automation. So laser capture microdissection is one method. There has been beautiful work from Ying Yang and others using lasers to evaporate uh, proteins and detect them. There is some level of tough imaging that can be done. Tough doesn't work so well with proteins, but people can pre-digest proteins to peptides and then image them. There are also other approaches that are being developed. So there are multiple uh, different complementary approaches that the community is developing. At the moment, what is dominant and widely used for biomedical research is based on immunofluorescence um, imaging. And you're going to hear quite a few talks about this, mostly tomorrow. Uh, Peter Sorger and Tralit are both going to present imaging methods that can be used for that. Uh, mass spectrometry methods have lagged behind in, the, in this regard, but there is a lot of enthusiasm for moving on that frontier as well. Of course, uh, I'll also say this imaging method um, using nanodesi so far has been demonstrated for tissue slices, which is not at single cell resolution or single cells in suspension. I think it's very exciting to think of possibilities that this might go down to single cell resolution in tissues. It has a number of major challenges and the gentleman sitting next to you is one of the world top experts to explain what these challenges are and more importantly, what potential solutions are, I hope. But uh, there, there are certainly exciting things going on there. Hi, I had a question about data analysis. Um, now we can analyze between 20 to 100 cells in the best case scenario, 1,000 cells per day, but still we need days or weeks to analyze um, samples. So that then is going to become a batch effect. So now there are few uh, corrections to solve that problem. So I read that the three plus DA can use one of the channels maybe to diminish the batch effect. How the multiplexing and parallel analysis is going to improve that batch effect in the future? 
uh, data analytics, there's certainly plenty of challenges on that side. There could be challenges with data completeness and different methods have different level of challenges. Shotgun methods tend to, to have the biggest issue with that, but certainly when we go to single cells, even with data independent acquisition, we tend to see um, lower completeness and what we would see for bulk samples. And there are certainly variation in chromatography. So I think that there isn't a single solution for that, but I'll I will highlight two approaches. And the first one is probably the less obvious for some, but the first one is minimize those batch effects in the data generation process itself. Because once there are a lot of batch effects, we can make as many algorithms as we want to minimize them. There is always a, ch a chance that when correcting a batch effect, we also introduce an artifact. And those batch effects, they're not unique to mass spectrometry proteomics. They're a severe plague for single cell RNA sequencing. And there are many, many dozens of algorithms that people have developed to combat those. Uh, so on the analytical side and data interpretation, we can learn to a degree from existing methods and through use for single cell RNA sequencing, as long as we are careful to recognize the differences, for example, mass spectrometry not being as dominated by counting noise is one aspect to be incorporated in modifying existing methods for correcting it computationally, and that is part of the solution. But I think another very important part is establishing workflows of data acquisition that allow for very robust chromatographic separation performance uh, and early detection of any deviations in the instrument and the system that need to be taken care of. And I, I, I'm not going to be more specific, but I would just say that there are many good parties that have helped tremendously in that regard. Even, even eight years ago when we started, having very consistent chromatographic performance for us was one of the big challenges. Now there are commercial products that are remarkably consistent. It's, it's a world of difference compared to what was eight years ago. And they see some gentlemen in the back smiling. They should be smiling. They, they've certainly contributed to help a lot with that. And chromatographic separation is one of the directions of that. And the captive electrospray also helps. If you can only position the electrospray in one way, that helps minimize movements. And there are very small pieces that all have to work together as, as, as one to minimize them. And they see a lot of good progress in that direction. We, we certainly have more distance to go. We have to apply the benchmarks. It's an ongoing effort. It's not something that we'll ever solve until it will just stay solved. It requires to establish a workflow for data generation that is robust and reproducible and consistent. And what, what we see is that even now with the technology that exists, we are able to acquire data that needs very little batch correction. It always needs some and always will, but it needs it at a level where we can feel comfortable that when we do it, we don't introduce more artifacts and we fix. It was a long answer because it's a complex question. <laughs> One more question? Except for the like the uh, bench effect uh, in the data analysis part, another um, uh, thing is missing value is very common. So especially when you're using the DIA method. So do you have any recommendations to yeah process those missing value? Absolutely. So there, there are certain general things that can help a lot to reduce missing values, increase data completeness. So with the data dependent acquisition, one approach that has made a huge difference is using the prioritization, making sure that in every run, the precursors of interest are reproducibly isolated, fragmented, quantified. So with this, you can go from having 30% data completeness for 95% plus data completeness 
that of course will not solve the co-isolation, but that's one approach for data dependent acquisition. But more conceptually, the approach is maximize the efficiency of iron delivery, make brighter iron source, make long accumulation time. So one thing that helps in that regard is being able to use, if possible, wider isolation windows with longer accumulation times because this allows to sample larger fraction of the ions available inside of the instruments. And trapped ion mobility spectrometry is one technology that helps for that. We can capture more of the ions, we can reduce missingness. With that being said, as much as we push, ultimately there will be some missingness left as we analyze less abundant proteins in smaller cells. And as we start analyzing not HeLa cells, in HeLa cells, most of the missingness is just technical missingness. There isn't much, much interesting to it. But as we start analyzing highly specialized cells, a lot of the missingness is biological missingness. For example, if we analyze peripheral mononuclear blood cells, we are going to identify T cell receptors on T cells. We're not going to identify them on monocytes. And similarly, there will be many specific proteins that are only identified in one cell type. And we can start having confidence in that. One thing that is advantageous for some of the methods is that even if we don't quantify a protein and we have a missing value, if we had a holistic comprehensive analysis, we can say that the abundance was below the limit of detection. And that is informative. It doesn't give you a quantitative value, but as we push the limit of detection to, to detect fewer and fewer copies, that becomes more and more informative. Thank you. Okay, one, one final question. Oh. I'll squeeze in my question. So mine has to do with like sample prep and um, using tissues that have heterogeneous cell populations. What kind of advice do you have for us to where we can be able to sample as many cell types that would represent our tissue of interest while still maintaining a good depth coverage? So if you would like to have good depth of coverage, sample lots of cells, we need to have a method that can and that can prepare samples for a large number of cells to be able to prepare thousands of cells. And the other thing that is crucial with primary tissues is to have a method that is very gentle. Primary cells, especially after dissociating a tissue, are much more fragile than most garden variety cell lines grown in the lab. So one needs to have careful dispensing method. And uh, the solution that has worked very well for us, by far the best, has been the NPOP method that um, Andrew LeDuc and, other, and others in my lab developed. Uh, it uses cell in one dispensing, which is much gentler than fax sorters have been in our hands. It uses piezoacoustic uh, pulses for that. And we've had experiences where primary cells that are lost with fax sorting, they burst and we don't get any results from analyzing them once isolated with a fax sorter, even a very good one. And when isolated with NPOP and prepared, they give us much better results. And there are a lot of things to be careful with sample preparation. It's one of these things that might appear um, not as exciting as the cutting edge manipulation of ions inside of powerful instruments. I agree with that. Mass spec is more exciting in many ways, but sample prep is not less important. If you don't get that right, then all of the downstream quantitation is not going to make sense. It's really important to get it right. So one thing that we discovered recently, actually, Andrew LeDuc was, was leading that, is that uh, there is a serious issue with protein leakage if cells are not intact. And this is something that the community has not paid too much attention to. But we found that it's really important to do it and certainly can alter biological interpretations. So. Uh, on the side of sample prep, if you're interested to start now, you're in good luck because there are a number of methods that I think are ready for deployment and can be used, and, and that's the good news. Uh, you still have to be very careful and you still have to do a lot of control experiments. So it's not exactly a turnkey solution. We try to make it that, but the truth is you certainly need the controls and you need to be careful and pay attention to it. Thank you.